Everybody to the Destiny Dugout. I'm your host, Cruz, member of the three time world's first team from Elysium, and this is what we've got going on this episode. Hopefully, you enjoy listening and let us know what you think in the comment section. Now, without further ado, let's get this thing started. Yeah, I feel like we haven't had a, had a, had a need to do an intro for a while, just basically <laughs> yeah, since we, before life. So usually our episodes, uh, they just kind of like Cruz and I were just chatting and Cruz will just randomly hit record, like not randomly, but he'll just like kind of just hit record. So it's like it, it, we're just like already talking about something as it kind of yeah. goes into it. So it's, just a, it's way easier than like a hard stop. But typically with our interviews with people, we do some kind of introduction. So Yeah, I mean, just sort of like uh, let them know like. I don't know, like, hey, welcome to the Destiny Dugout, yada, yada. I mean, I haven't done that in a while, but, like, more so just to kind of tell the person, the audience, you know, what's going on, what we're chatting about, kind of give a general overview. Because, I mean, normally, if it's just Vandal and I, we'll have a set of topics we just kind of fly through like we would mm-hmm. as if we were just chatting normally anyway. You know, at the end of the day, that's kind of how it all started. How how <laughs> long have you guys been doing this? Because uh, a couple feel like months. Oh uh, yeah, I mean we took like a little break basically because of so we started early Seraph, so basically last season. Okay. And then it. we were kind of just running through ideas, more so like what the future could hold, what aspects of Destiny you know suit players like us well, what don't. Big sort of mm. open ended topics like that because you know at the end of the day like we're trying to think of topics that are interesting for us to talk about. But are also more than just like, so yeah, forbearance is really OP, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, we, we want something like yeah, I was going to say, like, that's kind of impressive because, I mean, dude, <laughs> Destiny is not a super complicated game. So it's really it bad. Is, no. right? That's impressive. Um, you can think of, yeah, we try have, like get the podcast each week. We try and give people like somewhat of a glimpse of like sort of the the transition from like above average to like the the tire tier PVE player in a way. Yeah, right? and sure. like what, and, and like a just a tiny little, like a, you know, taste of kind of what happens up here. I guess you could say. I mean, in this world, right? Because people, people, I, I imagine people think it's like super toxic or like just you have to be crazy to be in here. Like, oh, it's insane, you know. But it's 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 really not. Like it's it's not like you said. It's not that deep, you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. Are you guys? Are we going right now? But uh, I have um, a recording, but I mean, I'll do another thing, but you can just keep chatting okay. if you want. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think the thing that most people like, it's so clear, man. You guys probably see this all the time. Like when you're doing LFG raids, man, and you match some guy that like is just trying way too hard and is like mm-hmm. just being toxic for so reason. <laughs> yeah. He thinks he's like being cool. It's like, dude, like there's actually not a human on this earth that cares, but <laughs> and, and it's just like, oh man, no flame, but the no nope. people don't <laughs> when people are like i guess trying to like get into the like higher bracket of destiny right like the entire it's entirely like connection oriented right because oh yeah totally how, how because... good like how good you can be is like entirely dependent on who you can play with a lot of the yeah, time if right? people can stand being around you <laughs> like that's a big <laughs> yeah. part of it and you need someone yeah. to be able to vouch for you as well you need to have somebody who then knows somebody who says hey this guy's yeah pretty good and then that goes to the next thing i mean to be honest, like if you think about when we were all together at one point, you know, from <laughs> that point in time to where it is now, I mean, it's like so much has happened, right? And it's like yeah. purely because of people, you know, knowing the right people. And yeah, I definitely think that's something that maybe like the general player base that kind of wants to be at the upper level, maybe it doesn't understand. I don't necessarily blame them. I, I think it's kind of difficult to understand. Um, yeah, but it's, to be honest, it's a lot like the real world, world where connections oh, matter. Yeah. 
and that's how oh, you yeah. get to where you like, want to be. You could have all the low mans you want. You could have all the solo GMs you want. But if you're insufferable and you just like think you're you're kind of hot shit around everybody and expect to just be like let in with open arms and like, oh, I'm sorry, your highness, like right this way. Like, <laughs> come on, yeah. man. Like, you can't be serious. And, and <laughs> like, word spreads fast. You know, it's like if one person has a bad in, uh, yeah, impression of you it. and uh, it's <laughs> tough to change that. Right. I mean, there's yeah. there's people we, we've known that are just kind of stuck with that sort of, I don't know tag on them it's like oh yeah i don't don't really want to be involved with them yep um mm. and it really but, doesn't uh, take much yeah no so. it doesn't right and i mean I, it's funny because like back in the day that's all we we were so focused on like doing low mans and like i don't want to say like getting our name out there but we wanted to like prove ourselves and say like yeah we are really good players you know eventually our time has come you know, SK, you've yep. got your chance now after uh, some WoW rating that you've you've got your your destiny uh, destiny thing that you can hang your hat on, which is uh, super dope. Um, I will use that as like our transition. I don't know when I'll start with the episode <laughs> and the video, um, but um, welcome to episode seventeen. Uh, this is just after uh, Root of Nightmares has completed. As a result of that. We're lucky enough to have gracious SK Presence, who is on that world's first team, who's here to chat about his experience with the uh, the day one and basically everything about the world's first. So um, first and foremost, thanks so much for being here, man. Uh, it's nice to chat yep. with you again. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on here. It's uh, definitely been a long time, but it's it's kind of cool to see how all of us are still playing Destiny after like multiple years and... The community is still just as small um, after all this time. <laughs> yeah, so. I know, right? It's a, <laughs> a tight, tight knit squad. I mean, I, I think it's funny. I'll just bring up the underdog thing, just because it's it's very, <laughs> very noticeable for me as well. Because at one point, my team was considered underdogs. Uh, when it's like, <laughs> were we really? But you know, to the general populace, if you're not math class or redeem, you're an underdog. <laughs> so, yeah. um, going into it like. What did you guys what did you guys feel like the raid was gonna be in terms of like what prep were you guys going into it with? Oh god. Um so <laughs> the most a big crazy thing, things ever. <laughs> no, so looking at previous raids, we have always found like opportunities to swap characters mid raid in order to like get an edge on other teams. That's like something that we've done in the past. Um mm -hmm. Like on Rolk, we brought in five Titans for Thundercrash. We would have gone six. We would have gone six, but Rowan didn't have Titan geared. He only had Hunter, so he went Hunter Roger for Rowan. Tether. <laughs> um, so this raid, we were thinking like, okay, if it's really long, and if it's like King's Fall, I didn't play King's Fall, but from my understanding, Dim was broken. We wanted to have all three characters ready to go, guns on all three. Um, in case you needed a swap and load into the raid without using dim at all to change any guns. So the our prep was like kind of insane due to that. Uh, of course, we didn't end up using any of it because the raid was short enough that we didn't need to. <laughs> but yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's, it definitely, it was kind of a an episode when we were just like logging in like a month and a half before the raid coming out, like doing all our deep stone crypts like sitting at shiro for three hours like leveling <laughs> multiple eps MPs. yeah like that's insane yeah, but was, i honestly kind of i really respect but... that because i feel like um for me and like my squad we did so much number crunching to figure out exactly what type of damage phase would make the most sense for certain things whether that's izzy with tracking rockets izzy with um you know explosive hothead Izzy and something else using just like a kata like it was like trying to figure out when do you use a div we did so much so hearing like another team go through i'll say a similar um experience of like prepping that didn't end up mattering is kind of nice to hear because <laughs> it's like oh, reassuring. Yeah, we... i'm like okay thank goodness we're not the only ones oh yeah we we i assume you guys also make some giant spreadsheet with every single gun on it that's like I don't know. We we literally make like those Nick videos where he like shoots the gun at a wall and records how long it takes to like do a certain combo <laughs> and like 
add up all the numbers <laughs> from shooting the Templar and then like see how much DPS it does. And then you compare all of them and think to yourself like, okay, which are good. Then you take each of the combos into like War Priest or something. If you can two phase like with only one Night Cleanse, then it's good. And if you can't, then it's bad. That's basically our test. Um, yeah, we do like all that kind of stuff too. So it's a uh, really, really exhausting and boring, but it's definitely worth knowing that information. Because here's the thing. It's like, you don't really know if it's going to matter or not. Obviously, yeah. we all do a massive amount of prep expecting as much as we can expect, right? It's like anything that we've had before could be here plus something new, right? So you have to be prepared for every possible past situation that could be similar while also expecting something new. And to be honest, I feel like each day one has increased that need to be or like feel prepared. Mm -hmm, for sure. There's definitely um, always been a lot of curveballs, I think, with day one raid bosses. Like, we weren't prepared for a caretaker type of boss, like, at all. Like, <laughs> I think most of us had, like, scuffed linears, like, with Vorpal on them and stuff like that. Instead <laughs> of yeah. line. Like, things like that. So, I mean, you definitely I learn a lot over time, like, what situations you need to be prepared for. I didn't even expect, like, Outbreak to be used for um wow so like when people were swapping to it i didn't even have mine ready and it was like yeah. i was just shooting a fun web while the rest of them were using outbreak i'm like oh thank goodness because I, that's something i just didn't expect and then going into this raid there was something where we were bringing up like when would it make more sense to use like touch of malice versus outbreak just in case there was a situation where you have so many rapid damage phases where ammo just isn't you don't like you don't have it enough yeah um, I was also definitely prepared in uh, Ron that we were going to get to Nezrak and it was going to be like an insane final boss. Like I was just thinking that in my head, like it was going to be like Sanctified 2 where everyone got there in two hours and then you were just wiping on the last boss for like 10. <laughs> That's yeah. out of in the dream. <laughs> yeah, like that would have been so sick and I was like ready for it and I was thinking like, oh my, like this is going to be insane. And then like, I don't know. We can talk, I assume we'll talk about that later. Well, so yeah, we can... we're going to go through the whole raid, <laughs> uh, especially yeah. from like your perspective, because, you know, going through it, uh, I quickly want to kind of want to touch on like more of that composition aspect, because I feel like with your team, you have a lot of flexible players. So like going into the day one, you know, you mentioned like getting ready for swaps. Are you guys all prepared to kind of be ready on any class, given um, the encounter situation that you kind of decide upon? Yeah, generally we are. We, like, some people like playing particular characters, like Puns really likes Hunter. Um, you know, Kai really likes Warlock, for instance. The other, like, I personally like playing Titan. I was going to play Titan in the raid. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we we thought, you know, just leading, the days leading up, like, Titan wasn't really that good. So they were like, oh. okay, you're just going to play Hunter. And I was like, all right, well, my armor for Hunter is terrible, but we'll figure it out. Um, just cause yeah. like, I don't know, it's, uh, we, we try to be as flexible as we can, right? There are situations where I think, I mean, really stacking Thundercrash on Rolk has been the only like really like egregious one where you run something like completely different from the standard comp just cause well, isn't that good. Yeah, well, isn't that good. And I mean, even getting to boss, I mean, what are you really doing? If you just throw Wither Hordes down. You're spawn killing all the ads. They're always spawning in front of you. You don't necessarily need what another subclass could bring. You could just bank on Cure's Thunder Crash and you'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we definitely try to be flexible, but yeah, there's there's some like people j picked like two classes. We're like, okay, I'll start on this class and I'll swap to like I'll, I'll have like Titan swap ready to go stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I think I, everyone I, I, had Titan as one of the two characters, and people picked Willick or Hunter outside of that. I think that's important because so to note that like that's sort of something that you learn very quickly like if you really want to like be a contender you need to be able to like on that on a whim fly to another class like go in because like like you said like the five the five six thunder crashes like that just it just made the most sense like it was the most free damage possible yeah. right like it's an absolute no brainer swap to titan like and and everybody on your team did it like no one I mean, sure, some people probably weren't too happy about it, but they understood, like, you know, 
I want to do this because this gives us an advantage. And that advantage is worth more than me just preferring to play Hunter or something. Right? Yeah, for sure. And that's... Like we, we were getting up to Rolk and Turtle was like, you want to bring as many Titans and damage supers as possible. And then that was like kind of the end of the story. Like we just trust him and, and we'll go with that and yeah, and whatever he tells us to run. Because we were really, really behind in, the, in that raid, actually. We were like at the final boss like two hours after everyone else or something. Mm, tell yeah, me I think it. A, yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of us ate, ate a lot of error code, so it was about the same. Yeah, that, yeah, that was not good. It was a nightmare. Uh, every day one has a story, so it's always something That's to true. kind of reflect Very true. on. Uh, it's something like kind of Vandal and I brought up in the last episode, which we did. We recorded it, what, last night? Yeah, like last crazy. night. Um, at that point, in terms of being uploaded, it'll probably be like two days ago. Um, but if you want to hear like our perception of the of the day one, kind of how it went, you can listen to that one. Um, going into first encounter, though, you guys, I well, I feel like generally throughout the raid, you were kind of one of the first teams to clear every encounter. Is that all right? Yeah, we were definitely like near the lead or like close to it for the the whole raid i think so how quickly you now i'm kind of watching this uh the clear too so i can kind of see this already but um how quickly did you adapt to just figuring out that just eager edge was just the play for most things i think the whoever was running eager edge in our raid i kind of forget i was like kind of just killing things on hunter Gerald falcons with lmg for the entire raid but like People love using the Eager Edge Sword, and I think on like second encounter, especially if they see any situation where like the movement from the sword is just going to help you, like people are going to take it. Especially in the current, I guess, environment of contest rating, where the tuning really isn't brutal enough for you to feel like you're burdening your team for not really running a real heavy weapon. I would say. Yeah, right? I think like, that's a big aspect I notice is that. The trade-off of running an eager sword for pretty much every encounter besides i would say third for your main movement players um and like the people that were going around with the orbs there really wasn't much sacrifice and that's something i think with my squad kind of took a little bit to fully understand and get used to like we were so set on like no 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 we, we should probably be doing the mechanic a little more properly where I think with you guys and like other squads, like ATPs, who is always kind of like in that front uh, position of the race, you guys are just like, no, whatever gets it done fastest, let's just do that. Because at the end of the day, it's all about just clearing it, not about doing it right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah, and 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 your and your comment, sorry to interrupt you, but your comment about you know the the sandbox and stuff, like it also doesn't help that warlocks have literally two nuclear bombs <laughs> that they get with a chest yeah. piece and a fragment or an, an aspect and so they can just run around with you know streak of forbearance or forbearance uh or no wither horde and um the void smg i can't remember the name unforgiven yeah, yeah and, and an eager edge sword and just be like completely fine like i'm not kidding those things are literal nuclear bombs <laughs> like it's you don't need a heavy when you have starfire protocol <laughs> yeah i honestly wonder like because this goes way back if they're gonna do something about swords because of like our team using them so heavily because previously like the big argument against like world line back in the day was like oh it's kind of a gimmick it's never really used in day one raids like it's sort of a for fun thing like why change it but now it's like okay, we just circumvent, like, the final boss of the latest raid's entire white mechanic by having people run around with a sword. Like, I don't yeah. know. Well, how do you see, like, it, how it evolves. A lot of it has to but... do with, like, the, uh, the obvious conversation of power creep, because back then, our abilities weren't that strong back then. Like, they were yeah. okay, but they definitely are nothing close to what we have today. And also, our arsenal wasn't that strong back then, you know? Like, Back in the world line days, yeah, our, our midnight coups they hit hard and they're really good at killing ads. But I mean, past that, I mean, we were still dumping like Nova bombs on like the big centurions, and, like prestige levy and stuff, right? So mm -hmm. now with our arsenal, with how much you can do with a single fusion grenade or a single pulse lead on Titan, like it's absurd. 
Like you can get away with anything you want in the game right now. And now with Strand adding woven mail, oh boy. <laughs> it's only gonna get worse. Yeah, I mean that's even another aspect with Worldline is that it's taking up your exotic slot. You know, you can't run Wither Horde with it, for example, or I don't know, not that Trinity is really that crazy right now, but at one point in time, Trinity Goal to us was like the most overpowered weapon in the game, purely because of how AFK was to use and how effective it was at item clearing. Um, so, you know, when you combine essentially the effectiveness of Worldline on not only like the right clicks where you'd like well skate, for example, but your left clicks with just Icarus dashing, and then also the fact that it's not an exotic as well as having the you know power creep starfire fusion aids it's like this is a lot to kind of add on to what the world line situation was once upon a time so it's actually kind of a really good point you bring up about how yeah at one point it kind of was there but like you said it's kind of a gimmick right and now it's used to circumvent the main mechanic of the final boss in a day one yeah, I mean, granted, you can, you could have just, like, not used the sword and still, like, made the check, but, yeah, I do think that the swords, like, being used all across the raid is definitely something that might get looked at. As much as people will flame me for saying that, because a lot of people, like, a lot of <laughs> yeah. the people I play with, like, speedrun a lot, and that's, like, yep. a thing, like, uh, I don't yeah. do it anymore. They live and care. die by the sword, yeah. Yeah, like, it, you have to wonder... What, if they're going to change it at all because they even buffed it too they buffed like the lunch distance or something like that, that and also they lowered the cooldown between eager edge like swings it was like four seconds then to three yeah so you can do it even more now and it's like insane i mean my team we actually got to damage without using eager at all we just had two warlocks on icarus dash and we did like a little thing in the beginning to kind of help them with time management like to just get it more consistent so it is doable, but if we if we had put on Eager Edge, I mean, I ended up watching you know Salt Cruz's team get the clear, and I remember watching Salt's POV, and he was just using Eager Edge and a Riptide, and you guys were cooking, like he was literally just shooting Riptide at, at a final boss on the day one contest raid, and you guys were going past half health, and I was like, what is happening? Yeah, <laughs> like I was, this is this is not real. <laughs> I mean, it's so interesting because there's two parts of it. First off. We do way more damage right now than we used to do because uh -huh. font is very free and easy to get and consistent oh, yeah. for every single gun. And loadout swaps. Yeah, loadout swaps too. And I think that the health of the raid bosses could have been a little bit higher, right? Because with the bosses having less health, that means you could get away with like this weird stuff that normally you would think in a day one raid you wouldn't be able to get away with. Like Puns and I were running LMGs on every single boss. Like imagine doing Rolk, or like, probably what's like an actual tight damage check boss? Like, I mean, War Priest, yeah, yeah War, like Priest. War Priest, but you're like running an LMG to kill two of your guys are running <laughs> LMGs to kill things, like, uh, you're just not killing it, right? Like, yeah, probably there's no not. way. But like, in this raid, that just wasn't even a problem. So, that was on, I think, like, it being on the teams to recognize that. That's like seeing how fast the boss's health bar moves down, despite like using a pretty consistent strat. That's definitely part of like day one rating and a pretty important part of it, I would say, rather than like full sending to try to like maybe skip a phase or something like that. Oh, 100%. Recognizing like just kind of the environment you're in and seeing that like, oh, we can get away with a lot. You know, like you yeah. basically you start you start to see the other side of that corner and you're just going to cut right through it. Like, like we don't we don't need to like respect it, basically. Like, in a way, you're kind of just like egoing it, you know? Yeah. And that kind of reminds me of when we were doing like Atheon as well. Like we weren't even shooting heavy at the boss. We were all running Xenophage to like get through the Oracles and then get through the encounter. And like we would like throw abilities and look at the boss. And like that was good enough for like beating the Enrage for us like in that raid as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that... as uh, real quick, just kind of talking about, I know you didn't do the King's Fall thing, but do you think they like Bungie's reaction to people complaining about like the Warpriest damage check had any effect on their own decision to kind of maybe make the bosses a little bit more squishy for contests? Or do you think this is more of an isolated situation of like, oh, Nezarek moves a lot, so we can't make him uh, have too much health? 
That's a really good question. Um, maybe I think <laughs> that because they did it in Caretaker too, and there's probably yeah. almost certainly a ton of day one teams that just like died at Caretaker. Like think about all those LFG groups, right? Like probably couldn't kill the boss because they didn't have the damage, weren't doing coordinating the finishers for special stuff like that. Um, I think maybe it could have had an impact. I think the third boss just should have had more health, like straight up. He wasn't even moving, but it was also yeah, kind of sure. like a damage check or like a sort of damage gate boss, I guess, but like not really. Like, I don't know. It's definitely kind of interesting you bring that up because I think that they, like, I would like to think they do internal tests for <laughs> what, <laughs> <Don't we> um, <laughs> for like each of the bosses. And they have like their raid testing team who's like meant to be the like sample average day one team like test case for the different raid bosses and i think maybe like if you weren't using starfire warlocks at all it might have been different but i'm not entirely sure because i didn't like do a raid with that because we were doing like contest raid reclears we were having we were just like okay we're gonna bring like three warlocks or something to make it not annoying right that was like really Mm -hmm. our only thing when we were just reclearing for fun um so i don't know yeah i think i, mean, I think they, they and caretaker are pretty response. similar both like being somewhat um damage checky but also reliant on ammo drops and maybe warpiece is better because they have the um you know like the majors that you can finish with aeons or, or the ultras i should say that drop mm-hmm. heavy ammo a caretaker only has that on master um i the community outreach i would say would general uh response was that oh it's too rng to get the ammo um but i mean even in in nezarak i mean you have the centurions right so in in the case of him i don't, I feel like they they did know what they were doing they're like okay here's an enemy if they need ammo they can do but then i still don't really know why he had so little health you know i don't know i yeah. think um what what you said about i i hope they do play test and like tests with like an average build um of like what they expected a, a regular day one team to run with is uh yeah i would love to that to be the case but i genuinely don't know with how the 3.0s work i don't know how much they do in terms of like I, genuine testing I, I find it you know now that i think about it when you think about nezarak and you know even even uh the explicator like nezarak there is an uh, absurd amount of ads that spawn and they all do relatively nothing. Like, even on contests, like, just nothing. Like, the Colossus just blinds you. Like, that's the, probably the most annoying thing they do. And like you said, the, they're there for the Aeons finishers. And I'm pretty sure they respawn, like, you get two before each damage phase or something. And the ads just, they just come in these droves. And again, just, they just do nothing. Which tells me that I think that they did test it. And they intentionally put that many ads to almost force the ammo so like it was in a way be actually kind of harder to not have ammo per phase right because especially with the bricks bricks from beyond mod i mean all these things lining up like it could be one big you know tinfoil hat conspiracy theory but in my opinion i I don't know it, it seems pretty pretty obvious yeah I think that's kind of interesting you bring that up. Like, now I'm thinking about it on the planet boss, right? Like, the amount of majors that you had in the middle, it yeah. made ammo. Like, your ammo was just insane. Like, we yeah. were all swapping the shoot to loot EPSMGs and shooting, like, f- more than a full reserve of rockets per damage phase. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, it. I think Bricks and Beyond is definitely, like, a little too strong. I mean, that definitely could explain partially why. Um, you know, that boss felt like relatively easier just because you had so many rockets available to you. But Nezarek, I think, I think they hit like I, I just think like the players and builds and stuff like that with the artifact mods are like a little too strong f- to make all of the ad clear checks, I guess you could call it, like a little too easy for like the top end teams. Like I'm sure teams that like aren't as good probably struggle with them a little bit more, but I think putting the centurions like next to the boss so they like feel slightly more dangerous to go finish is good just so it feels like a like a risk i guess to go try to finish all three of them or something like that 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, at the same time, I mean, it's just kind of objectively true that uh, more people clear this day one raid than ever. And it's partially can definitely be explained by the fact that like there weren't really any server issues, right? Or, and, you know, the raid was relatively accessible being available for 48 hours. Um, so teams could like log in on Saturday or whatever with the like strats that they could copy. But I do think, um, yeah, the, I think they'll, they'll learn from this one and, and we'll see something different for the next one. I mean, I so, right. yeah, I mean, I hope so too. I mean, generally like theory, tinfoil hat reasons, I kind of do believe that this will be hopefully more of the one-off type experience. Um, which again, I'm, I mean, I'm fine with, I'm fine with the experience that it was. It's, it's still something unique and that's, I mean, as a race, you just work with what's given, right? And at the end of the day, mm-hmm. one team works best in that environment, whatever it may be, whether it's a quick one, a long one, really damage checky, super mechanic heavy, that's just overly complicated, whatever the, the context may be of the day one. Ultimately, it just comes down to, you know, one team working best and kind of getting it done. And for this one, it's you guys. Going into, like, second encounter with the introduction of a second uh, orb buff, like Field of Light and the Darkness one. Did you guys run with like just one person per buff or did you guys integrate a second person for that? Yeah, so we um, we were doing two people with the buffs, like one going far and one like doing the home side. Mm -hmm. We just think like that type of thing generally made more sense. I don't know. I think something that a lot of teams do in in day one raids is they will like have one person solo a particular mechanic and i think it's just like not as good to do that sometimes just because um like there really isn't a whole lot of other things going on in in a lot of these raid fights outside of the individual mechanics and a lot of mechanics can feel like cleaner and easier if you distribute the weight on them a little bit right like, mm-hmm. I guess on Nezirak, like, the way we were doing um, the pass, or however you want to call them, uh, like, we, would, we were having two people rotate and do them, and then, like, our ad clears were, you know, fixing up everything else, basically. And, like, you could even have situations where you had the first person get the first three, and then you had four ad clears off the start, and then you had the second person, like, rotate in and chip in. So I, th- I think, like, involving more people is generally always good. And part of that is also your understanding of the mechanic, right? Because if you aren't fully, I wouldn't, I don't want to say fully, but if you don't have a pretty solid grasp on what it is that's going on with the buff, I mean, I can tell you right now, I definitely didn't quite fully understand it. Like then to me, I would say that involving more people would probably be a more of a detriment because you're just essentially throwing a wrench in your own, you know, gears. Whereas I think, if you don't have a full, if you don't have a pretty decent grasp on it, as long as if one person can get it done, yeah, it's not as fast, but it's probably safer. Whereas your team made the difference because you guys had a grasp on it, how it worked pretty early, it sounds like. And with that, you were able to essentially incorporate two people per buff, which would save an insane amount of time. And I mean, it shows, right? Mm hmm. I think, like, that encounter, we actually trolled a little bit. We wiped a few times on it, I got to be honest. So maybe what we were doing wasn't better than what other teams are doing. But it's. I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, if someone else, like, the mechanic clicks in their head early, then you end up kind of adopting a strategy naturally where you have more people chip into it. Whereas, like, another team's case of, like, two people are, like, geniuses and figure it out in like two seconds and don't want to say anything and just say i got it and then everyone else is like okay tell me what to do if i need to do anything otherwise just do your thing like it, it kind of just depends on how it naturally uh yeah i guess uh manifest yeah. that's kind of pretty much what i was thinking of while you guys were having that little discussion is ultimately when you guys go into it it's how how do you first respond to that mechanic if you guys initially just kind of feel like yeah you know what let's get another person involved that learning process and kind of integration is so much smoother because in my example 
we kind of did it a little bit later, like after. So Mupla and I were primarily doing a lot of the running. And then we sort of slowly integrated more people when I think if we just kind of stuck to it at that point, at least for a second encounter, it probably would have been done faster because then having to take the time for other people to learn slowed us down versus with you guys kind of immediately understanding hey you know what let's let's all decide we're going to integrate another person per buff that'll be smoother okay makes sense this is how it works bam you guys gotta get it done even with a little bit of throwing i mean i don't think any any day one is flawless there's always something you look back on and you're like damn why did we like suck so much on that <laughs> but maybe that's maybe that's your example in this case uh but, but i think i don't know if you guys agree with that but i think for you guys that makes sense to me and why it works yeah, that's it's kind of interesting you bring up that last point about like some encounters always feeling bad after the fact. Like looking back at especially in the longer raids, I think it's more of a thing just because there's more room for like errors to happen. Uh -huh. But like it feel it felt like we trolled in VOG and Val like so much. Like if you'd asked me when we killed the bosses, like how we did, like I would be like, there's no way like we were even remotely good because like you're just such a you always like criticize your own play as a team like so heavily and then you realize like, you know, all, a lot of the other teams are probably making similar types of mistakes at the end of the day and it kind of just depends on who makes a, a couple, you know, fewer amount of mistakes to yeah. see who finishes the raid fastest. A lot of what day one races are about is making less mistakes than being the team that optimized the most. Because at the end of the day, you're just trying to get through it. Right? It's whatever whatever works for you guys on that day. It, it can be a, a crazy uh, idea that you guys come up with and you're like, yeah, this, whatever. Just we know how it works. We're all on the same page. Let's just do it this way. Get it done and move on. Yeah, and, and I think just looking at the number of mistakes isn't accurate. It's, it's also the timing of these mistakes. Like a big one and, uh, you know, is I'm pretty sure in King's Fall, I believe there was a team that was ahead of you, Cruz, that was about to kill. They were just just ahead of you in, in damage. And they were about to get into final damage about two, three minutes before you guys. And someone accidentally killed an ogre, which failed the challenge. And at that point, like they were at the end of Oryx, which that's a long that's a long encounter. Like making a mistake at the end of an encounter that length, mm -hmm. it might have been one of their few mistakes the entire raid, but that's it. That one, that's enough, because you lose so much time. Um, yeah, that's pretty that's... much in that case. It's like for our run with King's Fall, it was okay. Let's treat the ogres and knights as equal. So let's just yeah, whatever whatever they are, we'll just like we'll swap both of them. Just just be safe because we don't know. Like we don't have the time to figure it out. So this run, we're just gonna do both. And for us, it works because that's kind of what it was. For the other team, it wasn't because it was actually both right. Yeah, that like you said, that one mistake of not necessarily going that extra effort to double check, um, and also making sure you don't throw like like solar nades or pulse nades at these ogres. Like you can help people, but you can't throw something that could potentially steal that kill, right? And that's also part of like what you're talking about, like the the planning and thinking about it. Like you just said, you can't you can't afford to make those you know kind of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So um so like going into the we talked a little bit about like planet boss planet encounter the explicit well i can't even do i can't even say the name. Explicate, planet explicated boss. thank you man thank planet you. Boss, I, know. Yes. I just say planet um very cool um room but honestly at the end of the day it's a pretty simple mechanic what did you guys initially see the planets as and like how did that work into eventually figuring out the mechanic as in like did, did do you find like the planets visually make it a little bit harder to kind of understand what was going on i think when we first looked at the planets we were like definitely a little bit confused for sure like that what made it click for us was people had tried like interacting with each, with each planet and they saw the planets start moving and it kind of made sense to us like okay we need to move the planets in some way Grangle figured out like very fast that like we need to match all the light planets on one side and all the dark planets on the other 
we just didn't necessarily know how to do that for a long time. We were just troubleshooting different things to try to see how we could exchange the planets. And then once we had it figured out, though, it was a pretty quick recognition of what was going on. We got the damage and we saw how far we got. And I remember there being something scuffed about the attempt where we killed the boss. And I was thinking to ourselves, like, do we really kill here? Like, do we keep going with this? And everyone was like, yeah. We keep going. We, let's just play it out <laughs> and see how many phases we have. Just because, I mean, the, our following phase when people were more familiar with um, the damage phase and had their shoot to loop guns on and stuff, it was a lot uh, better for sure. So, yeah, it's funny because we just, um, like, on my POV watching it, I actually just had your damage rotation where you have the boss pretty much at, like, I don't know, like 2% left before final. And in Rowan's POV, he does swap to get some shoot to loot stuff. And it's like, yeah, if just like one or two more per people had, I don't know if like the other people were swapping or not. You can let me know based off that. But if, if it was just a little bit more, it's like that would have been so much faster because now you have to go through a full nother phase. Yeah. One thing that we kind of, it happens accidentally, but it almost feels on purpose at this point, is we kill bosses extremely often, like getting them right above final stand before going into the last <laughs> phase. Because, yeah. like, there's no... I've never wiped to a final stand on a boss fight in my life, and, like, by gosh darn, I will keep it that way, right? Like, we <laughs> did the same on Rolk, I think. Like, we did it on that boss. We also did it on Nezarek as well. Um just because if you go into Final Stand with no ammo at all and you wipe, like, you just wasted so much time. And it, it definitely would just be heartbreaking to, uh, you know, lose a raid race that way, for sure. Yeah, pretty much the only benefit of going into it without the ammo is, at least if there's a new mechanic that you have to involve, it's like, okay, you can figure that out since you're not killing anyway. Versus, mm -hmm. oh, we have ammo, oh, there's something we have to do, and now we just lost because we didn't know what to do. And we kind of ruined like a really like good run because we all had ammo already. Um, fortunately for both of these, and even with Rolk, there really wasn't anything added. So the moment you kind of get there, all you got to do is just do more damage. Did you guys actually expect like final to have anything else, or did you guys just anticipate just more damage? I mean, I personally thought it was just going to be more damage. I feel like most Destiny bosses are generally like that. We haven't gotten like a mechanic based final stand in a while. I mean, I guess you could say King's Fall has one, but was that mechanic in there in D1 or not? Like the the extra ogres for final stand on Horus? That was an. I mean, since you never really had. I mean, there wasn't like an added damage thing, but once you did all the bombs in D1, he would just go to that spot and then you just shoot his chest. So they did okay. integrate those final bombs to uh, add a damage phase there. Oh, got it. I guess the mo like another example I can think of is like Riven. I didn't raid day one wish at all or like week one wish at all, but I've I don't think they haven't done like a, a super interesting final stand in a long time. So I didn't really expect it, honestly. But it would be cool if they did that. If there was like you get the final stand of Nesrock or something, and you need to like get both of the buffs because you're just continually just nuking the entire raid with the you know transition mechanic mm -hmm. so i don't know i didn't definitely expect anything yeah i definitely think that would be a cool integration though you know it's like oh we know there's uh okay i just see what you get. you you stepped on the wrong plate in your final thing that's the curse thing you did by the way oh. so like hey it was a dark buff and you guys went to the light thing Oh, <laughs> fortunately, you just kind of had your entire team kind of go to all of them. We we're like, that's immune. Just go to every plate. Just, just damage. <laughs> you guys, there's so little, right? So you guys knew you had it pretty much as long as you shot one rocket. But that's pretty funny to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree that it's there really isn't a an example in Destiny right now that's really that good. I, I do think honestly, Oryx is the best example of. Okay, there's these ogres that are spawning, and we have to detonate that to actually get that final stand but at the same time it does kind of feel a little bit more natural in oryx because at the very least that's the same design as all of the other damage phases right mm -hmm. like you have to do those bombs for damage you know there's a final stand you're like it's 
it's reasonable to expect that there would be that same mechanic for that final damage phase. Um, so I guess that kind of goes into, into final with Nezarek. Did you guys immediately try to like figure out the mechanic or like, did you notice like his pulsing at all? Yeah, we, we didn't really understand what was happening with that. We thought like to prevent him from wiping, you had to like shoot his chest and his shoulders or something like that. So we were just like shooting his chest and his shoulders. And we eventually figured out like shooting the chest was how you get him to stop sending people up in the air. But mm -hmm. yeah, we never figured out that white mechanic in our, because I mean, we just weren't on the boss for long enough to figure out like those type of things. Yeah, like really, that's, that's, we that's kind of something I was thinking. Sentence. That's an well, insane I mean, sentence. For right sure, there, right? it is oh strange. My God. But it's, it's reasonable because it's like, yeah, I think I genuinely do believe that if for whatever reason he was super health gated um, and it was or like a damage check style that we would have learned. Like somebody eventually would have noticed, hey, he pulsed white that time instead of yellow when I broke his shoulders. I wonder if that has to do with his pulse, his like death wave that he does. Mm -hmm. Somebody surely would have noticed on among one of the several teams that that have been there. But like you said, you just you're not there long enough. At the end of the day, if you're just kind of progressing through the mechanic, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm, for sure, I think a good like analogy would be like if sanctified mind was like such a light damage check that you just like two phased him. Like you probably would have never even thought to try the second tether, for instance, right? Oh yeah. Yep. I yeah. completely agree. I feel I mean, like that's kind of like was, what we're dealing with here. It was visually bugged too, I'm pretty sure. So I mean I I think most people didn't even know you could double tether because the, the color never changed, right? Yeah. So it just didn't I mean it, it, hindsight twenty twenty it doesn't hurt to try. But why try and the color doesn't match? Like it's you know, you're in that mm -hmm. moment. It's like, what do we get? Why are we doing this thing when it visually looks like it's not gonna work? Right. Mm -hmm. And also for for final, uh I guess maybe their idea was that after doing the jumping puzzle and and kind of surviving those giant, you know, pulsing waves, you would that's you would assume that's their way of teaching you how to survive final, but it's in, it's until you broke the shoulders and we're actually paying attention to the sheen that shows up on his on like his body, which you didn't see anywhere else, right? And that sort of leads me to my next question, which is, what do you, th what was your like reaction to seemingly no like very little mechanics actually transferring besides the seeds? Like it was just like the the, the seed passing thing was the core, and almost nothing else like culminated. It's a final like we're used to, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's definitely typical of a Destiny raid where they just use the same mechanic like going into yeah. the end boss. If you were thinking about it, like historically, like maybe they would have added a third color or something to the end boss and all mm -hmm. six people would have had to run or something like that. Just because like the natural progression of like adding uh, complexity to it over time. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I think the I wasn't doing a ton of the mechanics in day one. I'll be honest with you, but I I think that in hindsight, like a, a lot of the mechanics they added to the end boss, like definitely summed up the raid decently well. I mean, the planets are kind of their own thing, and I think them taking mechanics from a mid encounter transition, like in the transition between encounters, um. That's like new. I don't think we've really seen something like that before. So that was kind of neat. But at the same time, the if you had two people running the the seeds, the the timing was such that you didn't really need to worry about it given how much health the boss had and what you needed to do to kill it with a very primitive understanding yeah. of what was going on. I I almost think that even just taking first encounter and being blocked by the scions that spawn. If you threw that just that simple scion mechanic into final boss, it would have forced people to deal with the wipe instantly, like just that alone. Oh yeah, um, because sure. I think it would have it would have messed with enough time um, that it would have you know you would have had to figure out a way to survive it. Oh, yeah, and, and, I mean, 
he was almost exploding before you got to like second damage phase with like day one knowledge of the pathing and stuff like that. Like people weren't yeah. perfectly timing it up and stuff like that. So yeah, and 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 seeing the the mechanic behind the scission, the second encounter where those centurions come out and you you need to have the buff to kill them, like that and the scions basically effectively never showing up again or showing up together at all. I, it's just weird. I don't know. Like Cruz and I talked about this, you know, yesterday, but um, it, it just, it feels odd. Like I just, it, it doesn't, I don't know. Like it almost makes sense to me for them to spawn like three centurions and then have scions during final boss that kind of periodically spawn. And then to me, that feels like a, like a complete boss encounter, you know, cause like, like you said, they took the, you know, the intermission between encounters mechanic and put it in boss. And I guess the only thing they added was shoot his chest. <laughs> Cause otherwise you're, you're effectively just fighting a tormentor. <laughs> like he's literally just a regular tormentor, you mm-hmm. know? Except yeah. when, I don't know. You bring that up and oh my gosh, this fight could be so baller if they have those mechanics in there. Cause like, imagine if let's say the Colossus like were immune unless you had the buff, so you had to have people Yeah. She had to like it. weave yeah, yeah, people like weaving between ad clearing and like doing the mechanic, you couldn't like fully separate the roles and Mm-hmm. If you had science spawning in, you also had to like integrate that. And even all the bosses shooting people with like those one shot void projectiles. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's like no cover, just generally pretty stressful. You have the white mechanic you have to do as well. That, you can, I mean, like, that you would've... can either play it fast or slow in that situation. Yeah. I mean, you play it fast and you'll probably have to deal with maybe one white mechanic. Or if you play it safe, you'll have to deal with two, but you know, you, you'll less deaths probably but i mean with those factored in i mean that probably would have added i'm not gonna say it would have added you know four hours to the boss but you know i'll I'll play it safe and say at least 30 minutes <laughs> yeah 30 minutes yeah i thought your safe was gonna be two hours <laughs> you know what i mean uh it's funny because I, I think that's pretty much what you were talking about sk earlier where you almost like expected nazarek to be like okay this is where they're gonna really bring in something and I think what we're kind of talking about here where, you know, you throw in a scion mechanic and you also need certain, like, either need the light or dark buff to kill certain dudes, which would allow you to then get, like, another orb, let's say, or even stun the boss. Just adding in, like, a second and maybe third level with previous encounter uh, mechanics. Like, yeah, like you said, this... This fight could have been absolute baller with that. Yeah, I think if they added all that stuff, they would have had to have just gotten rid of the like shooting in the chest mechanic, just because. Uh, I think that would have been too much for. Yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. most that, that is a lot going on. <laughs> that getting the boop that booped up thing was very frustrating for about five minutes, and then you just shoot his chest, and it's it's just not a mechanic anymore. Yeah, <laughs> especially because there's nothing else going on in the fight. So, you know, you have the guys clearing ads and eventually one, you know, every now and then one guy just kind of peeks in into middle and just puts a sniper shot in. Mechanic done. It's mm-hmm. kind of insane. Progressing through the fight of Nezarek, did you change your loadouts dependent on how you felt like your damage output was? Or did you kind of stick with what you initially had going into it? I th- the only thing that I really changed was throwing Aeons on. I was playing on Jira Falcons for the rest of the raid. Um, I mean, the Aeons are just kind of mandatory on a boss like that without majors. That was like the first thing we were looking for was, are there majors? Can we like just ignore and blast all the Colossus and not care? And the answer is mm-hmm. we couldn't really do that. But also, if you try to finish every Colossus every time, I think that was way too dangerous and risky. And you could kill the boss without doing that. Especially if doing it like how we did with, um, you know, being relatively conservative and just like playing for consistency. So I th- in terms of other loadouts, though, I think, I mean, the rockets and and starfire grenades kind of speak for themselves. Those, yeah, uh, I mean, that's pretty I, much all you need. The our entire comp was built around four people running that, and then you just have 
Puns and I were just cycle tethers. We didn't even think about divinity. Um, honestly, I think divinity is in some situations better, but uh, yeah, in in our team was built dumping. around. Yeah, our, te <laughs> our team was built around. Our team was built around dumping rockets because in our tests, rockets were just so much better, like real world wise, than everything else in terms of like how fast yeah. bosses were dying when we were just trying them. But it was like okay. Whatever lets these guys cook, like Puns and I are gonna do, and you know, I think two tethers was the answer to that. Pretty much, at least from the numbers perspective, if the damage phase isn't really long, or the um, this boss health is just insanely high, you'd pretty much always be running rockets because the even the trade off of maybe hard to hit crits, it's just like rockets help make that up anyway and then especially once you add on like your starfire locks and you guys running what four of them right yeah we had four like, that, like that's a lot of just ability damage you know that you just kind of get to tack on for free. you don't even really need mm -hmm. izzy's at that point just just go rockets and fusions and that on a boss like this where he doesn't necessarily have that massive health pool that you got to consider your, your ammo concerns aren't really there yeah, I think that's part of what makes Starfire like a little bit egregious as it does really it gives you something in your back pocket even if you just have no ammo. Like push comes to shove. If you're out on everything, you can still primary the boss and throw grenades and that's like okay. Like it's passable if like a couple mm -hmm. people have to do that. So I don't know. Yeah. I think they yeah. nuke that chest piece from orbit very soon. Or the grenades. <laughs> yeah. But I mean I agree. To me, the only way you could even, I mean, whatever they do to it, it's going to die. Like, it's people are going to essentially deem it just dead, sort of the same way they did Hoyle. But even now, Hoyle is still like, it's still a really solid exotic. It's just no longer like as completely like, you can't, you can't just like make a one button macro like you could before. Like, you actually kind of have to sort of think a little bit, just a little bit about using Hoyle now. Whereas before it was just like you could probably hit one button and it would cycle all your buttons, you know, and 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 do play the game for you essentially. Um, yeah, and I, a big and Starfire thing, is like, now the same thing. It's just that Starfire needs so much more consideration in terms of how you design something from Bungie's perspective. The moment you don't require the players to move, Starfire is infinitely better than if you have a situation where well sucks or you just don't have enough of them so that's why like honestly in a rogue situation like i wouldn't even think starfires obviously for like general play it's still super broken but for the free damage output perspective kind of isn't because you're you have to move so much if you just sit there he's gonna kill you all in your well maybe mm -hmm. they thought nezarek with his suppression and sort of jank movement you're like, yeah, you know what? Starfire maybe won't be as much of an issue. But then all we did was just hop on plates, and this guy doesn't know what to do. Yeah, if you take out like the ability insane. to damage on plates, like maybe his health pool makes a little bit more sense. That that to me is insane. Why how is that even pot? Like you talked about them testing SK. How did they not see that people would just stand on any one of the, I don't know, 12 plates in the room? And the boss just literally can't do anything to you. You don't even need a well. You could be in a healing rift and be completely fine. Yeah, I think when we were doing the three men earlier, actually, the boss got onto the plate with those, and it was the worst thing ever, by the way. I would not recommend <laughs> it. But um, yeah, it, I honestly, like, that boss would be so different if he just one shot you straight through the well if you, like, sat there and tanked mm -hmm. it. I agree. I like, mean, that's pretty much what Rolk did, right? I mean, you'd sit yeah. there and just, he'd just fucking slam, kick you, whatever. <laughs> You're dead, <laughs> which was which was great. That's why I think so many people liked Rolk as a day one experience because he felt so unique. I think they tried yeah. to emulate it, but just kind of missed the mark. Rolk popped bubbles, popped wells. Like, he... He did not care what you put in his way. He blew it up. Oh, and this gosh. guy, this guy, you can just, you have people putting a video up saying, you know, oh, put a well down when he jumps down and then melee him and he'll just stand there stunned in a well. Like, and it's just, that's insane to me that you're doing this on contest of all things. Just full egoing a boss. Like, even in a well, 
I don't know. I that should not be a thing. I think that's part of the other thing with like Starfire. It's like, yeah, maybe maybe Starfire isn't as OP if like well isn't as OP. I mean, hell, they could even take away the fact that you get ability energy back from being in a well, right? Where it's solely Empress. I don't know, because I don't want them gutting things. Um, not that I think they did too much to kill Hoyle, but I just don't think the context of Hoyle being broken in a boss context was nearly as broken Egregious. as what like, Starfire was. Yeah. It was more so just like general play, right? It's like, okay, you play Void Titan with Hoyle with 10 second timers. Yeah, your abilities are probably a little too fast and a little too strong. Uh, it was also it was also Arc too. Yeah, but like the Storm, Storm Nades, they killed Storm Nades by so much that it's like, and they it even made Thruster a longer cooldown when all it does is literally dodge. There's no other ability you get with it. So yeah. I, I think, yeah, obviously, Pulse Nades are still pretty good. Them getting a damage buff is also like good, but you sacrifice so much on Arc Titan versus what you get playing arguably the strongest subclass in the game on Well that it's like, they're not really equal in my opinion i'm happy that hoyle got nerfed but i was really surprised that like starfire didn't get touched or at the very least balanced around for this day one because it, it was pretty crazy like you know we're all talking about it. it's like yeah you could just run starfire you run out of ammo your damage at the end of the day is still like strong enough you know it's like you're not sacrificing that much i think that's also why eager was super strong as a general movement play because you need damage output to kill something. You, you do have your your uh your nade, right? It's like that nade is still strong enough. Yeah, I think the fundamental problem with it is they put the like very conservative day one rating class, aka warlock. Mm -hmm. It's the same class that does the most sustained damage, and yeah. that isn't good. I think. Like, I mean, it's just we bring four of those to the raid, right? Like, you just in, you stack as many of those as you can, and you find out how little of everything else can you bring to make it not feel awkward. And for us, that answer was bring two hunters for two tethers for longer damage phases, so you can debuff them the whole time. Yeah, and I don't know. I know, like. You guys and Salt talk about well a lot. We kind of just play. I don't, I don't really care like if they nerf or buff anything. I'll just play the game that's in front of me. But it definitely does get stale after a while if the same class is like always good. The god class, yep. Yeah. I think man, that's, well, the previous version while, of well. Man. Yeah. I think there was a period of time where well was like, it was good, but... You threw a well, and that was pretty much it. Maybe a healing aid here or there, kind of thinking like around Vogue area era Warlock, I guess, where it was like before the reworks and stuff. But it wasn't like insane year two, like everything dies type of well with Luna Factions. Mm -hmm. I think it was in a decent spot then. But and especially when your well could break from the boss, that was another thing. That was like the resilience change, neat. one of the first resilience changes. Yeah, just making yeah. resilience a good stat. Because when resilience being, wasn't uh, a good stat, yeah, yeah when they first well did just it. Died. Yeah, yep. it, it, they changed it, and Rezus wasn't in the game. So I was like, dang. <laughs> I mean, like, not they really needed mobility for a lot of things other than like genuine like speedrunning type things, um, for Warlock. But when you make resilience like the strongest base stat in the game, now every now every well is just like maxed out with the uh, its health and it never breaks anymore it's not really even a concept um so i think like that's pretty much i mean last thing i say is like what was your initial reaction when you kind of figured out that you guys won oh it's definitely kind of crazy like we i mean <laughs> it's one of those things that you watch every world's first race and you think to yourself like dude these people are such losers man like there's no <laughs> shot they're like screaming like oh bungie please confirm yeah. it bungie please confirm it but like until until you're there like you, you don't really know how it feels to yep yep you know finally crazy. sort of realize like it is your team like when we we finished the raid we went to orbit and all that and you like look on twitter and you see like the most hype thing you see is that like 
oh, we have early reports of a, yeah, of we a reports winner. Reports of a team completing the yeah. raid. You're like, oh yeah. my god, I think that's us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And we also hadn't gotten any messages from anyone that like said that we uh, that like other teams had completed too. So it was like, I don't know. It's it definitely seems like kind of crazy in hindsight, but at the same time, like. You know, it's just another day of gaming with the boys, right? We uh, we do what we do, so <laughs> just having fun. What you do, just just easy dubs. Or you guys, are, you guys are the underdogs. The underdogs yeah. that have been consistently placing in top ten for the past couple of years. Totally underdogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, once you win the next one, then you won't be. You're chilling. Then you'll be. Same. Then you'll be uh, one of the expected teams to win. <laughs> Um, um so we have a question i don't know if we already we i know we sort of asked uh, someone this question but uh barbucks asked in the discord here uh i heard you play some games like wow i was wondering if they ever touched simulated practice in destiny like low light or etc if you just sort of just play all sorts of challenging activities together outside the game without att- the attention of practicing for the race so i guess he's sort of asking like do you do like do you guys do any like low light raids like some kind of stratting a little bit uh and farming like gms or or doing any of that stuff to sort of prep like doing master raids you know at any point yeah so we do not do any raid practice like that at all that's dedicated during the middle of the year preach yeah we um a lot of us don't really play a ton year round we kind of do not quite the bare minimum to keep our characters maintained, but we're not like grinding day in and day out usually. Um, there's not a lot of people online like mid season, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. For Elysium, it's the same, right? People aren't really playing a ton mid year, but uh, we, I guess, like to prepare for the raid, a lot of us started playing maybe like a month or two before. And I know, speaking for myself, I like got prepared to play Lightfall by doing basically 200 GMs the week before trying to get a win to go. That was not fun. When that <laughs> That's insane, bro. That's insane. No, it, it was bad. I, we were so unbelievably delirious in those things. It was not good. And, uh, but yeah, so I was, I did a lot of GMs that week. Parker did a lot of GMs. That's Osiris. Um, puns, same thing. So that's kind of how we prepare. We just try to find ways to play the game together um, before an expansion comes out. But I think a lot of day one teams see like content creators um, doing like low light raids where they like throw on the white bond from collections oh, or something Jesus like that. God. And I, ha- I will say I have done one of those before. It's not a good use of time. You learn nothing from doing it. And <laughs> yeah, I know. Especially, right? well, you, especially... All you learn is how to play super passive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, especially since you're doing content you already know how to do, and if you have blinding nades and or stasis on, you're you're effectively wasting time. Like you're actually just wasting your time. I mean, I remember seeing like this was oh, this was so long ago. It was before <laughs> Crypt or something like that. People were doing low light gardens and like oh, I remember people would be doing people be in like the second encounter like head glitching on stairs like in a part of the room you've never even seen before mm-hmm. with oh, a bow. Yeah. yeah, like with a bow. Like it, it's I it's I like wouldn't the, vouch that for that will never it. get used in a day one. Yeah, <laughs> I think let this be known. Yeah, I think for anyone that's, like, looking to find something to do in Destiny to, like, prepare for day one raids, right? A big part of day one raids is um, just kind of being, like, good in the moment, like, on the spot, uh, playing well, like, in situations that count. And the only thing in Destiny specifically that really emulates that are doing um, low man flawless full raid challenges, I would say. So, like, things like three-man Val, like two man king's fall stuff like that so there's a a lot of different things that um you know challenges like that that you can spend your time with that would help you prepare for the raid if that's something that you're looking to get advice on i I'd, I'd even throw in there too uh doing gms but doing gms efficiently like really kind of like after after every run looking for ways that like let's say i see that you've been shooting a galley at, at, at like a champion every time we go to this room I now do something to 
either instant kill that champ with you or shoot a rocket somewhere else because now I have pack hunter or something and like just essentially like like you guys are farming your Wendigos. I, I assume you guys were just literally just chatting and it was like muscle memory at that point just going through this like the motions essentially oh, yeah. and like and that's and that's part of the day one is like when you're playing with your team your teammates getting into that 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 sort of that groove where you're playing with them enough that like you sort of start to like not even notice their tendencies but you just kind of build off of it naturally right mm -hmm. like i know like s case in it like push up ahead here so i'm just gonna go with him because if we're both there then we both could just kill the ads faster and like get through this faster you know little things like that i think are are especially in like repeatable stuff that that you're typically farming for something anyways like a gm like you know wendigo week was like that's that's i think i think there's some value in that too yeah and it just you want content where it's not like very boring stuff where you have no chance of dying because then you don't really learn anything or that's like true, build yeah. or you can just kind of like build bad habits i guess that's kind of like weird to say if you're like playing strikes all day but <laughs> um yeah i mean <laughs> if you think about that gm week in warden of nothing the things we were doing on tuesday were not the same things we were doing that following monday like <laughs> you get to monday and people are like <laughs> two people are driving ahead like one drives all the way ahead for the trains yep. and stuff like that it's like dude yep. yeah like, so yeah those are the definitely i would definitely say that changed. too yeah, it's just like a way to like almost practice natural optimization from just reading habits and learning from each other i think that's a big thing that like a successful day one team has is that kind of ingrained nonverbal communication that you guys can just naturally learn from one another and work as a team. So, you know, the more efficient you are as a unit, the better you guys are going to play in that day one. So I definitely think anything that, whether it's low mans, GMs, or even anything outside of like even destiny, um, just things that kind of challenge you as a group are, are things that are worthy of consideration to work on to maybe, maybe perform a little bit better. Um, another question we got, um, one of two, I'll, I'll end off with, an, with another one after this is like pregame. So like before, like, let's talk about the night before the day one, you guys have a, have somebody who goes through and does a speech for you guys, or like, how do you, how do you kind of make sure everyone's on the same page? So I think we don't really have like super formal, like speeches like that. We have, <laughs> uh, Dang, we have like a, we have we have like our own discord where we just uh you know puns was hyping us up a lot definitely for sure like just typing things out like we did so much prep like we got this like let's go big you know type of stuff like that we're just kind of like hyping each other up in the discord um morning of our tradition is we get a, a six-man free-for-all lobby on jav 4 going an hour before the raid starts and we do it for like 30 to 40 minutes so people can then like chill right before the raid but it's just something to get your mind off the fact that the raid's about to start right because i think people are always pretty nervous right before the raid comes and um just something to get you like warmed up get like your hands warmed up and mm -hmm. take your mind off it a little bit that's like our big uh our ritual are the, are the the pre raid free for all lobbies i think that's pretty that dope to hear. really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude, I totally agree though with like just <laughs> helping ease your mind, get you guys in, in like with good vibes going into the day one. Um it's a it's a pretty good idea just to distract yourself. Because I mean you all know what's coming. You're all ready for it. But it's more so about just being being in the best mental headspace to like work and adapt and, and feel comfortable with each other so that's that's awesome to hear um my last little thing uh it's just like your overall thoughts on like the contest and how it felt as a modifier compared to past raids with contests because i mean once upon a time you know we did goss together i would definitely say goss felt like the ads hit harder but then again we also have a million resist things and yeah I don't know if the game is really tuned the same way that it that it should be, but I want to hear your thoughts on how it kind of felt as a squad on that first day. They could probably dial it to like minus thirty. 
I would say. I don't think that would really negatively affect the rate at all, especially considering, like, there's always something just super busted for ad clear in every single raid. It just changes each raid, so you have to figure out what it is. Like, in this raid, <laughs> in this raid, you put on commemoration with, like, every Void mod in the game in Volatile <laughs> Rounds, and you kill every ad in two bullets. Like, yeah. uh, yeah, like Rage Wrath War Mind Cells in Deepstone Crypt. Like, we've never seen that before. Those are also in VOG. Like, I think um, contest difficulty, they could definitely make it feel a little more brutal. But I do think, like, it's hard for me to look back at Garden specifically because I've definitely gotten way better at the game since then. Our armor back then really sucked. Like, remember, we were literally just in, like, whatever oh, gear yeah. we could get in the <laughs> yeah. armor system. Oh man, that, and, was, that was tragic. I remember getting like 62s and being like, oh my god, that's sick. <laughs> yeah. So I think that they can make the raids feel a little more brutal, but just like tooting wise, like add health, boss health, add damage, boss damage type of stuff. But um, yeah, it kind of just depends on how mechanically complicated the things are too, because you wouldn't want to end up in a situation where it's just like an insanely complicated mechanical boss and like you're getting one shot by the snipers that spawn on like the edges of the platform, right? I think mm -hmm. there's like a good medium for them to hit. Um, but yeah. I think the bigger issue is overall damage resistance and um, like mods and stuff. Because this is something I've learned from playing... Uh, wow i guess just to bring that in a little bit is that things will feel infinitely harder in any game if like large damage ev events will start one shining you rather than bring you to like 10 percent health and destiny is like a perfect example of that right we're like let's say if you get hit by like a certain attack if you just get one shot and it's wraps like that's a totally different ball game than like <laughs> oh you just you just throw a healing aid right before it hits you and like you're generally going to be okay yeah, I agree. I mean, one, yeah, once you start introducing one shots, like even just looking back to when GMs first got introduced, I mean, it, it was just one shot city. Like you couldn't even you couldn't even fight two scions safely, and and, yeah. and the first GMs like it was literally like you had to play like CS:GO like Rainbow Six Siege style like jiggle peeking scions with your scout rifle, like plinking away at them because if they get a hit on you, you're you're basically about to die. Yeah. And I, I don't think, if it gets to that point, I think the game is horrible, by the way. I yeah, despise exactly. those old GMs. I never played them. Like, we we would, like, just farm masters instead, like, during those seasons before the adept, mod, or adept like, weapons came into the game. Um, I know Cruz and I, we braved through them because it was just sort of something to do, but... It's just such a unique experience, you know, <laughs> Destiny never really had. And, I mean, yeah. we haven't had it since I've been tuned as well as adding in so much more resist. It's yeah, like, yeah. I, I wouldn't say definitely, like, in terms of overall health of the game, I, I don't want that everywhere. But um, anything I will say to expand the overall difficulty, so, like, the easy things be really easy, and then gradually get to a point where, like, the really hard things are really hard. The day one doesn't need to be that peak sandbox difficulty it just kind of needs to be in the sweet spot with what you mentioned how mechanical or how, how much influence the mechanics have on the day one because i think if we come into a situation like king's fall was once way back in the day you can't have a raid like that be too challenging um because there's so much for the player to be able to need to understand to get through it Versus mm -hmm. a situation like Wrath, or I think even this is a good example. Not everything needs to be the most mechanically ch insane for it to be a good raid. It's just the vocal difficulty then has to be shifted towards, you know, the boss is having a lot of health or high damage. You guys dying easily. Just a lot of different stuff like that. I think that's a good point to, to emphasize. Yeah, like I, I said, not everything needs to be fucking gms one hitting you yeah i think i do think people criticize i mean i've like looked at twitter a little bit for the past like day or two and i, I think people criticize this raids day one more than it deserves right because like 
Wrath of the Machine is the comparison that a lot of us are making, and it's like people think that raid's like one of the best raids in Destiny history, and World's First took like two hours, and it was still, and it was like for the same reason almost. Like there's contests now, but like health wise, tuning wise, it was just easier because people were like over level. Yeah, I so mean, I think, Scourge is like another D2 example of it, we're over leveled, and the raid is pretty easy. Obviously, with contest being in place, you don't have that over leveling, but it it's a similar experience. I yeah. think I think context is is something that a lot of people are forgetting, and like right now, a lot of people are, from what I can tell, they're harping on the fact that we waited a whole year for this, right? And that's sort of what they're getting hung up on because, you know, raids back then, it just it just something about it, just the game it felt like they were coming sooner rather than later, and even in D1. And so that's why those, those raids almost survived any backlash that maybe they should have had, but was because they were coming in at a better, you know, pacing, better rate. Whereas this one, there is just this huge gap and, you know, they're expecting something similar to, to what we've been seeing. And then it just kind of took a pretty decent step down. You know, um, yeah. from what we're kind of used to in the in the D two sandbox, and I don't know. I think I think now with all the low mans being done on this raid and this be this being like the ultra low manable raid, from what I can tell, it seems like a lot of people are kind of turning it around a little bit. I mean, I won't lie, like everybody was kind of blowing up, but I didn't exactly like hate the raid. I didn't even really hate the day one. Um, you know, and I think maybe people took, took their reactions were a little too rash and like quick, right? Cause now you see all these people are three manning, two manning, uh, Quaz is working on the solo right now or trying to theory craft it. Like if they, if they really hated this raid, they wouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. you know, simple as that. And that's why this, this raid has a place initially for the day one. It may have uh, sort of been a little underwhelming, but everything passed. I think it's going to hold up. Like this, I feel like it's going to be um, kind of one of those staple low mans that you're going to see a lot of people doing, as opposed to some of the other raids we have. And it doesn't seem terrible for a low man. I mean, you just did one, so I mean, where would you where would you put it against some of the other raids? I think it's. I think it is maybe fourth for me. I say Wish is my favorite. Of course. Garden's, Garden's second favorite. <laughs> Cra Crown. Er, card Crown was uh, my third favorite. Two Man Galran, definitely a banger. Mm -hmm. And then this one is the one after. I, th I thought it was pretty fun. I haven't really messed with it a ton. I haven't really looked into it. I don't really play like challenges a lot like mm -hmm. I used to. I kind of just will hop in and do uh, like one off, like full raids or like boss clears with like friends just for fun type of thing. But yeah, I, I think it's a good raid. I mean, I, I enjoy it. I think the challenge is good. I do think like the next day when we see will be tuned a little more tightly. I think we saw this with Deepstone Crypt going into Val. Um, mm -hmm. Crypt yeah, was I think like, that's a great example. People people thought Crypt was too easy on day one. They bring in Val, and they definitely knew what they were doing with Caretaker's HP. I think if Caretaker had less HP, the clear percentage would have gone way up because, like, Rolk, I think, was easier than Caretaker was, personally. Maybe... I would just maybe disagree. that's a hot take. Maybe yeah, that's a I think hot that's, take. I, I would I think say that's that a is. hot take. Because but I, I think, think it's the comfortability of like running thunder crashes and like re not relying on wells for the average player is actually kind of a, a difficult thing for, for like yeah. a squad that you run Maybe with. That's true. It's like you're chilling, right? You, you can play the game without well, but you know we see the people fucking defend well, and you know they they need it. So, um, whether or not you have that for for the top areas, you know, different. You know, obviously you don't need it because kind of just makes you anyway but for like the lower area i don't know phoenix protocol will still probably 
yeah kind of needed by the by the general populace but in terms of like damage check i think for the average player caretaker was more of an issue purely because of like the optimization you needed to actually kind of have a good chance of killing by the time you got mm -hmm. to his final stand and and it's good that you brought up dsc real quick i want to ask you and dsc uh bungie came out later and admitted or basically said said later on that the ads in DSC were scaled, like the AI were like patrol AI, right? Yeah, instead of like raid AI or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and like so it was just inherently like wrong, right? Do you think that something like that happened here? Or like maybe because because I brought up a, a cons like kind of a conspiracy theory that the boss's health bars weren't scaled right for contests or something. They just weren't scaled right in general because the fact that we were cooking final boss like 60 percent plus health in one damage phase and it wasn't even optimized like to me i'm just like there's just no way that's insane yeah i don't know i think a big part of it has to do with the fact that they probably did a lot of their testing for the bosses um without using like super optimal stuff and in this current sandbox the most optimal stuff is just way better than like the sort of optimal stuff, right? Like so the average full, yeah, like full surge, hothead, spamming grenades, um, you know, debuff uptime at a hundred percent. Like they they added, I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, because you just grab an orb on the ground. Like I guess they added a like a sort of a skill gap to doing damage that maybe wasn't previously there. So from the top end, it seems like kind of a joke damage check whereas maybe like when they were looking at the health bars before they were intended with like a bigger audience in mind yeah I mean, I let's know. be real the average player is not running around with uh demo explosive rockets for their their starfire build yeah you know they're just running any auto loading rocket because that's what the content creator they follow said is like a good thing to use you know, I've been there. I've followed some maybe not super optimal things before. That was many years ago. And then, I, can, I can relate. <laughs> and we got, I mean, my team, we got Data on board with Thunderlord. So now he puts out a video and now Thunderlord is the meta. Are people we using Thunderlord in it? Oh That's what gosh. we killed with. We killed, oh, we killed really? Thunderlord. Dude, Thunderlord oh, bakes, shit. man. Wait, dude, because we I looked did, at Thunderlord before the raid. We were thinking about that. It and cooks. it was like, yeah. The biggest like insight from pre rate testing that we found was you could have people run that uh what is it retrofit void uh, LMG yeah. yeah you could run that LMG with like fourth times and target lock target lock and you run the artifact mod with it and you have volatile rounds going and it was like kind of hybrid DPS ad clear it was like mostly ad clear but like your damage wasn't embarrassing if you used it yeah. I mean, that was like something that we recognized really early. It was like, okay, maybe just have some people run this LMG. It'll make everything way cleaner. And, you know, if we're just dying during rage, we'll not use it, but we're going to try it and see if it works. And in this case, I mean, it just kind of worked for us because the bosses like had as little HP as they did. Dude, we, we did some testing with uh, Thunderlord and specifically with Divinity because Thunderlord with Divinity is like the perfect combo. Because those lightning strikes, when they hit that divinity bubble, it gets you that reload, like, guaranteed. Whereas there's some bosses that even if you hit in their crit, it messes with the Thunderlord reload. And we actually, like, 100 to 0 Caretaker and just the final stand plates, right, with Thunderlord. Um, one phase roll wasn't even optimized, like, all that well. Like, we were doing some some mad tests with Thunderlord, and we were like, this thing, this thing fucks. So we actually used it in our kill. We almost said we I think we did about half his health with uh, just a single DPS phase and just Thunderlord shooting the div bubble. And How I'm pretty sure did you use? Um I think we had like probably like 120 bullets left like with the latest machine gun update it got a big reserve increase and yeah. the damage increase too. Like and it was very ammo efficient in my opinion to like damage. Yeah. Yeah, we almost completely missed LMGs being used for like DPS like that, I think. Yeah. Like it we we were told by someone else that we should try it. I'll be honest, and because we didn't think of it ourselves and it mm -hmm. was uh very very good. 
and we tried Thunderlord, and I think I don't know what we tested it on. We didn't really, we never did a full like fire team test with it with Divinity because we didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of cool. Like I, I love it, dude. When people find like new like tech like that that like works and is good, and it's like something that you've never thought of just because it's so different and like not what you would expect. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, on on. Nezarak, it's such an easy damage phase. You literally just because when when the dev bubble's on him, even when he does his little like kind of jumping animation, you just keep shooting under him. Like yeah, it's a nothing. You're basically shooting into nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like and the damage. only time you stop shooting is when he ports, and that's it. It's it's the it's like one of the easiest damage phases, and then you have both slots, so your special and primary, to just clear ads and do the encounter. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean that's. That's it's just it's crazy to me that this is this day one kind of went how it went, and it, you said something and I still it's, it's been ringing in my head like we weren't on boss long enough to figure out the white mechanic. <laughs> I can't I can't get that out of my head. That's literally like <laughs> what an unreal statement, you know? Like that that's mind boggling to me, man. But that's just that just it goes to show like like you were saying how you put most people in the buff and that's because you kind of had a better grasp on it than other teams and like you guys very quickly realized like sort of the difficulty like scaling you know early on and you realize kind of what you can get away with and what you can't and that that's how you win you see you see where you can take your advantages and you just go. Mm -hmm. you know this was the first raid where we were like not behind immediately i don't know why but in every raid that i've done like with this team we're always just it, like we'd be done with the first encounter and we would learn that we're like 30 to 45 minutes behind every other team and it's like <laughs> dude like, uh, damn it, like <laughs> and so i don't know yeah like it i think that really it kind of speaks for itself where I feel like we play pretty well on end bosses and this is like the first time we've ever been in a situation where we weren't so behind on the end boss that we could eventually come out in first. Yeah. You excited to get your pink belt? Yeah, I don't know what the, I'm going to do with it, but uh, there will be <laughs> some. Get, get an Ikea shelf like me. It works well. Yeah, that's a... Uh, I have like one of the two by four things sitting behind me. A lot of my furniture is from Ikea, so... Maybe I'll give that there a look. Go. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of different things you could do. At one point, I thought I was going to put it in a glass case. But that's, I don't know. That's a lot of work. Although it looks, it would look nice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, if if Vadal doesn't have any more questions, then uh, I think that's it for us. Yeah, I mean, it was it was great to bring the half of the old Goth squad back. I know it's awesome yeah, to have the, have one the DC. squad back. I don't know. Holy moly. <laughs> we can't yeah, who knows what happened to the other squad. half? But <laughs> yeah, like, literally, bro. Let's, just, literally. let's just talk about this half. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll stop it there for sure. Do you think it is kind of crazy to think back to that team, though, SK? Yeah, I mean it's it definitely. I mean it's like stereotypical day one team. I feel like we're the team falls apart because the team isn't good, even though all the individual players are like generally pretty good. I think that's like it, what can cause issues for a lot of people. Because we've had it before where um you know there's been like some minor chemistry issues on the team where some people on our team like didn't like playing with others and you know you you have you have to account for that when you're looking at like previous raids sometimes. Yeah, I mean, no, no team is perfect. I mean, I think there's always examples of, you know, past teams where, you know, I was talking to Vinyl about this, like, literally yesterday, is that, you know, like, even my team, like, there's aspects to where, like, we aren't that great with, and, you know, we gotta improve. Obviously, with you guys, I mean, you just talked about how, like, you always find your, your openings, you're, like, behind, and it's, like, if you guys could consistently keep pace... I mean, that's who knows what would happen, right? In that alternate, that alternate reality we have. Um, 
but yeah to uh close it out because i don't want to keep you too much longer um appreciate you uh to hopping on i loved hearing what you had to uh to say and i think you did a really good job explaining a lot of different aspects about uh about the day one how things went for you guys uh super happy that you won like it's really awesome there's yeah. <laughs> not many other teams that you know i'm more happy to see win um than you guys so kudos to you guys congrats on getting the belt appreciate and, it uh Vandal, do you have anything else to say uh carry me next year in wild please <laughs> There you go. Keep up you the just, wild grinding. I'll send you uh, the contact for sales for sure. I'll be good. Oh, God. <laughs> oh no, they don't already have to pay me for all the Destiny stuff. I don't know if you can afford you. <laughs> I'm an infinite dead here, man. <laughs> Metal struggling. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, yeah, that'll be it. Uh, everyone listening, watching. Um, thanks for the support. Next episode, I don't know what we'll talk about. I think we we've got a few different ideas. So. Yeah. Um, just uh, stick around, hop in the Discord if you aren't in there to kind of get with the community. And we will see you in that next episode. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, check the description for SK Socials uh, and see ya. Yep, thank you guys for having me.